All right. Hello, everyone. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are in the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Ali. I'm a bookseller at the LFP location, and I am your host for this evening. And I am so excited to be introducing Molly Hashimoto here to discuss her book, Mount Rainier National Park, an artist's tour. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so very much for tuning in. As much as we miss having you all in the bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So I will be linking directly to books in the chat all evening, so it'll be super easy to go find them. For all of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we do ship. And once again, we are so, so grateful for your support. Uh, while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. Uh, speaking of social media, if you'd like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find most of them on our YouTube channel, including this event within the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to see our other virtual events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. Uh, while we're So we're here for about an hour. And towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. We would love to know where you're from or your favorite latest read. But when it comes time for questions, please do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Um, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So on our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which, you know, this is Zoom, it could happen, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we very much appreciate your patience and understanding. So I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce award-winning artist Molly Hashimoto, who explores parks and wildlife refugees, refuges all over the West, seeking inspiration for her sketches, paintings, and prints. Her work appears on calendars and cards, and she is the author and artist of Colors of the West and Birds of the West. Her newest book, Mount Rainier National Park, an artist tour, follows along the National Park's main road, exploring the major visitor areas, natural wonders, popular landmarks, and park flora and fauna. So thank you, Molly, so much for being here with us. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. The same goes for all of you in the audience. I will be in chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to Molly. So welcome. Thank you very much for that great introduction, Allie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do my share screen now. All right, this looks great. Great. I need to get up there to that. Yeah. It's up there. The slideshow. Oh. Mm -hmm. I want that to go away. Yeah, Ellie, I'm trying to get to my uh, slideshow and the uh, taskbar for uh, 
for oh i see i see what's happening let's see if you click on slideshow in your um um you know i can't do that because for some reason the uh zoom stuff is oh okay so maybe if you go into like shrink the screen a little bit yeah there we go and then go ahead and try and push it that way oh, there we go and then i'll i'll make it big again oh great okay perfect <laughs> Bingo. Love to love it. All okay. right. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, thanks all of you for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the book. And I, I just like to start by saying that I had a purpose in writing and illustrating the book. And I think the purpose was to share everything that's impressed me over the many years that I've been going to the park. And my aim was to bring together the art and writing to give a sense of the deeply moving experience of being at Mount Rainier National Park. And my hope is that the book will help visitors see how they might approach drawing, painting, and writing in order to express their own excitement about the park. Before proceeding, I just want to thank Kate Rogers, Rogers Editor-in-Chief of Mountaineers Books, who saw my sketchbooks and envisioned potential for this book on Rainier. And then I want to thank Anne DePew, my agent, and Kate Bizart, an amazing graphic designer who's worked on all of my books, and all of my friends who were so kind to loan me photos, some from my very early days of hiking. Um, there are many things I couldn't capture with my own photos and sketches, and I really needed my friends' photos to help complete this visual representation of the park. So thanks to all of you. Um, I'd like to start by reading a short passage from the book, and I'll set the stage for that first. One day in the first months of the pandemic, I drove up to paradise in rainy, misty weather. And driving the last stretch of the road, I could see some blue sky, and I could see Mazama Ridge appearing on the east skyline. I drove into the parking lot. There were only six cars. It was a weekday. The weather was bad. And of course, a lot of people were staying home because of the pandemic. So I'm going to read you just a short passage now, what I wrote. With great anticipation, I put on my boots, got out my ski poles, and began to walk in the snow that was still piled high above the parking lot. Soft spring snow, perfect for walking, yielding just enough, but not too much. Bits of the mountains came in and, mountain came in and out of view in the mist. First Anvil Rock, then Gibraltar Rock, then Couch Cleaver. It was like seeing these landmarks through a gauze curtain. Yet the sun was shining on paradise the whole time. I wanted to walk and walk, climbing higher and higher in hopes of seeing more of the mountain. It was thrilling to know that I was completely alone. The sun was out now, but mist swirled and at any moment could create whiteout conditions. How would I define that moment? Sublime. As I looked through the veil at the vastness of the mountain before me, I had no companion to share this experience with, nothing to distract me from the sheer vision of it, a singular moment of beauty. And then my next thought, how am I going to paint this? Following that, my imagination lurched away in a contrary direction. I thought of plunging into one of those treacherous moats, hollows that encircle trees and are hidden beneath the snow. If I fell in, would anyone find me? I chickened out, but it wasn't a defeat. I was already making plans to draw and paint what I had seen and to read and learn. And by the way, I have to tell you all that, you know, I, I really struggled with this and I still have not come up with a good painting for this, a good expression of it. I've lived in Seattle since the 1970s. I used to hike and ski and scramble in the park during my 20s. Here I am on Pinnacle Peak, a scramble in the Tattoosh Range. On that same outing to Pinnacle Peak, my friends and I climbed the castle, another peak in the Tattoosh Range. But I didn't like rock climbing very much. I found the vertical exposure really unnerving. So I often sat below the peaks and I looked out at the scenery while my companions climbed. I think I soaked up a lot then, even though I wasn't trying to draw or paint on location. 
those weekend outings kept me going during the work week. When I'd eat my lunch down by the waterfront, I'd see Rainier, and it was always a place I dreamed about and imagined myself going, even when I wasn't there. I could see the mountain from my first apartment. This view, oh, by the way, I wanted to show you this because this is the castle and uh, Pinnacle Peak Sketch this. Um, the castle is the one on the left and Pinnacle Peak is to the right. Uh, this is the view that you can see from Union Bay Natural Area. This was before they built the high rise on Highway 520. In the book, I talk about how the drawing and painting I do when I'm outdoors or back at home helps me honor the experiences I have. I liken it to how travelers in the Middle Ages on a pilgrimage route would get badges to pin on their cloaks. The badges were a kind of souvenir that acknowledged their effort and was proof that they had been to the shrines. A famous one is Santiago de Compostela in Spain. People are still walking that route today. The shell is the emblem of St. James or Santiago. Some people today put bumper stickers on their cars from all the national parks or they buy postcards or t-shirts. The sketchbooks I've been keeping since 1998 are something like that. The book's arranged as a tour around the park and in it I, count, I travel around counterclockwise and the map shows some of the major areas of the park. I begin at the Nisqually entrance, a gate constructed in the National Park rustic style. That architecture is found all over the park. And from there, I proceed to Longmire, where I painted this view of Rainier and Autumn. Architecture isn't the easiest subject to paint, but it's an important part of the park experience. So I include several sketches and paintings. And here's a suspension bridge over the Nisqually at Longmire. And just a little beyond that is Christine Falls, which flows from Van Trump Creek. This is a concrete bridge faced with local stone. And it's probably one of the most beautiful examples anywhere of the National Park rustic style. Beyond that, the road climbs up to paradise. And one of the most awesome views is from the Nisqually Vista, which you can walk to from the lodge. And it's also wheelchair accessible. In my painting, you can see how it looks in July with avalanche lilies blooming. From the viewpoint, it's 2,000 feet down to the base of the Nisqually Glacier and then up almost two miles to the summit. Ever since I first visited the park, I've been interested in the flora and fauna. You can't help but notice the remarkable trees throughout the park. The first to strike me were the subalpine firs and then the mountain hemlocks, two of the most beautiful of the tree species. They live in the subalpine meadow zone, which is made up of heather, huckleberry, and just a few tree species. People come from all over the world to see the wildflowers at Paradise. It's perfectly situated to absorb all the precipitation of Pacific storms, and most rain and snow falls at around 5,000 feet, and that's, that's why it's so perfectly situated. The weather comes in from the south and southwest. These are some of the earliest flowers, the avalanche lilies, and you can see some have just a little bit of pink on them, and that's as they get older, they're not quite as white. They bloom just as soon as the snow melts. Along creeks, you'll find Lewis's monkey flower. And steep slopes are covered with Sitka valerian, and my favorite has to be the western anemone or pass flower. The mop heads on it form after it flowers. In many meadows around the mountain, you'll see whole fields of them. It has some great nicknames and people noticed it right away, even in the 19th century before Rainier became a national park. One writer of the 19th century said they looked like grenadiers caps. In A Year at Paradise, writer Floyd Schmo, Floyd Schmo likened them to troops of monkeys. Some other really great nicknames are Toehead Baby, Old Man of the Mountain, and mop top. Well, I think my favorite is mouse on a stick. Here's a little close up of what they look like with the giant seed heads. They are really cool. If you've ever been to Rainier, I'm sure you've noticed them. Another really common plant is the bear grass. You see that in a lot of subalpine meadows and it's spectacular in bloom. That they, they can be like four or five feet tall. The native peoples of the Northwest 
visited Rainier for thousands of years. They called it Tacoma or Tahoma. They would travel up from the east and west sides of the Cascades in later summer to hunt and to pick berries. It could take a woman nearly a month to make one of these beautiful berry baskets and they use cedar roots and bare grass leaves to create some of the designs on these baskets. According to Floyd Schmo, who lived at the lodge in the 20s, when native people were still coming annually, the baskets were highly prized and could actually hold water without leaking. They were passed down for generations. And a visit to the park is definitely not complete without seeing marmots. Um, these are some of the most unique mammals in the park. They've always fascinated me with their highly social habits. You can see them in many places in the park, generally uh, on slopes with talus and huge boulders. Scientists think they're extremely social because it takes two years in such a cold and inhospitable climate for the young to mature. Here, this is an adult doing sentry duty. Here there are two very young juveniles touching noses or possibly they're about to have a mock battle. You might see them doing both. The Cascade red fox is one of four subspecies of montane red foxes in the US. I learned about them from two scientists, Keith Aubrey, who studied them for his whole career, and Jocelyn Aikens, who's the director at Cascade's Carnivore Project. These foxes came over from Asia on the Bering Land Bridge during the Illinoisan glacial stage. When the foxes expanded south to the US from Canada, they got isolated from other populations. And when the glaciers retreated, the foxes had to retreat to the higher elevations of the Western mountains. Really interesting that the DNA of these foxes is quite different from other fox, the lowland foxes. And these foxes are adapted to the cold. I was super excited when I saw this fox. I had no idea that the reason she was making her appearance was because she was used to getting handouts. She has a name, according to Jocelyn, it's Whitefoot. You notice her back foot. And she's in the habit of hanging around paradise looking for handouts. Biologists say this is definitely not good for the fox or for the human beings. And rangers definitely try to discourage it. So I continue my tour going over the Stevens Canyon Road. And this is probably the most photographed scene in the park, uh, Reflection Lakes. It's at its most beautiful in the very calm early morning hours. And here you can see spirea blooming alongside the road and the reflection beyond. Just a little further down Stevens Canyon Road, I saw this amazing splash of scarlet paintbrush. Several miles further down at a much lower elevation is Ohana Pikash. And I had never been there until a few years ago, but the first moment I set foot in the Grove of the Patriarchs where you can experience thousand year old Douglas firs, I knew I had to paint this and go back often. Here are twin Douglas firs, which I painted in honor of my twin sister, Jane. The Grove also has many ancient Western red cedars. And I really love this view of the downed log. It's so indicative of an old growth forest. It isn't just the living trees that constitute that particular world. It's all the decaying trees on the forest floor and they contribute greatly to the health of that ecosystem. Continuing around the mountain, you come first to the White River Sunrise Entrance. From Highway 410, it's a real short drive to the White River Campground, which is where climbers begin the Emmons Glacier route to the summit. You can hike to Glacier Basin, which I've done a couple of times. And here's my sketchbook page, which shows some of the highlights of that hike. I use different materials here, some water-soluble pens, pen and watercolor, pure watercolor with, you know, just a little pencil drawing. They're very small vignettes, and these kinds of things are really very quick and easy to do. Recently, my friend Paul and I hiked part of the trail and we, you notice this um, stream here. Um, when Paul and I hiked it, we stopped to take a look at that and here it is. I really wanted to add that because 
I wanted you to see that, you know, there are many different ways to experience the park. And I think each one of us comes to the park with our own interests, our own special attention for various things. My friend is, loves music. So for him, the, the auditory uh, qualities of things are especially important. For me, probably it's visual. Uh, I'm an artist, so that's obvious that I would like that. Um, I think there are people who really love the scent of conifers or the taste of blueberries, or maybe the feeling of cold air as it rushes off a snowfield. There's so many different ways to experience the park. Another part of the park that you access through, through uh, this side is um, Sunrise. And this is the Wonderland Trail. Um, you notice these red plants growing on the ground. It's called Newberry's Knotweed. And I would say at other times of the year, it's not particularly noticeable or interesting, but in September, it turns this brilliant red color. And I, th I think it's just stunning. Sunrise is a, is a much drier part of the park. And so there aren't quite as many, well, definitely not as many wildflowers. The trees are also smaller. Um, it has kind of a lunar landscape look. And there's something about this red, red knotweed that just really struck me. This is a little further down the Wonderland Trail towards Berkeley Park. And uh, this, this particular plant is called shrubby sink foil. Um, I've seen that several times and uh, I felt like it, I just really had to paint that. This is the view of Little Tahoma from Skyscraper Mountain, which is also above Berkeley Park on the Wonderland Trail have a really great view of Little Tahoma from there. And Little Tahoma is a subsidiary peak of Mount Rainier, in case you didn't know that. One time I sat below Skyscraper Mountain and I did this two page sketch of Rainier. It's funny how it took up two whole pages in my sketchbook. I mean, it is just so big, there's no way you could get this on a single page. And when Stephen Mather, who was the first director of the National Parks, envisioned the road around the mountain, he pictured that it would go from Mowich Lake um, and uh, would meet the West Side Road, which, which comes off uh, the park road near Longmire. But unfortunately, that never happened, or perhaps I, it was fortunate that it never happened. So. As you drive around the mountain, the Carbon River entrance is the last entrance to the park. Just before you get to the Carbon River entrance, uh, you will come upon the Fairfax Bridge, which was built in 1921 near the coal town of Carbonado. And it's only one of three of this type of bridge in the entire state of Washington. It was added to the Register of Historic Places. I thought it was so cool, I had to draw it. The engineers designed it with a three hinged braced steel arch. And it's quite beautiful, perhaps a little bit, you know, on in decline, it's a bit rusty and you don't really see that in my sketch. But what's really cool is you drive over it, you park your car and then you walk back over. It's a one lane bridge and you look down to the Carbon River uh, it's almost 100 feet down. It's pretty thrilling. When you go to the Carbon River, part of Rainier, you'll see that it's very different than the other areas in the park. It's extremely quiet, and it's one of the wettest areas in the park. I visited once in January, and this is a sketch of Tommy Creek, which is real close to the entrance, and this I saw on a very rainy January day. So just wanted to tell you that um, Mountaineer's Books has, has published two of my other books. And, you know, if you enjoy the Rainier book, you can check out Colors of the West and Birds of the West. I'm at work on a new title, Trees of the West, which is going to be a companion volume to Birds of the West. And another thing that I wanted to tell you about is that I'm doing some other events in conjunction with the release of this book. The first one I did was actually just this past Sunday, I went down to Seward Park Audubon and I did a hands-on art class 
and you know very short book talk and i had a lot of people come we had a great time sketching and painting uh, i plan to do the same thing here's a picture of us my friend took this it was so great the sun actually came out we thought it was going to rain and i had people of all ages that's my favorite type of thing you know to have that that kind of a group come and see just how fun it is to try to connect to the mountain in in the in this way i'm doing something quite similar at the cascadia art museum on uh, thursday october 21st and that's from 5 to 8 p.m that'll be in conjunction with the Edmonds art walk and I'm also that same day doing an art chat for the Winslow Arts Center. Um, that's going to be a virtual event, but I, my plan for that one is to do some demonstrating of some of the techniques that I use to illustrate the book. So perhaps you'll want to join me for those. And I'd like to show you a few sketches I did for the Rainier book that didn't really take me very long. This was an Amanita mushroom, and I used some pen and watercolor. Um, I'd say this probably took me about 10 minutes to do. This one is an Alpine lady fern. Um, probably took me a little bit longer because you can see that there were a couple stages here. I had to paint the yellowy green of the fern and then get in there with some brown in within the fern this is how the fern looks in autumn and it's just gorgeous i was just so knocked out by it it's not very big it's probably about a foot tall and i saw this on the skyline trail up by the paradise glacier but it was so gorgeous uh, i had to do it now there's pen on it too and this one probably took a little bit longer, but it was a very simple little sketch in the sense that there wasn't much to it. I mean, it's just some rocks and the fern. I think it's definitely within the grasp of a person just starting out. And this is a sooty grouse that ran across the trail right in front of Myrtle Falls. This sketch is done with pen. Um, I used a brown felt tip pen and some watercolor real quick, left a lot of white, also done pretty quickly. And um, I, I wanted to explain, you know, what I do when I create some of these sketches. I don't do everything on location. Absolutely not. I take a lot of photos. When I get home, I look at them and I title the best ones. I, I give them titles. I don't leave the number from the, from the camera. I don't leave that because if I do that, then I'm just going to end up with a whole lot of stuff on my phone, which I won't be able to find. So if I don't know what it is, I look it up in one of my field guides or I'll look it up online. Because I like to know if, if it's a bird or a plant that I have never seen or I'm not sure what it is. It's fun to know. I think that's really good. I think that extra step of naming it or looking it up really helps me remember what I saw and why it impressed me so much. So, you know, these days it seems like everybody is talking about how we need to pay attention. And there are a lot of ways to do that. You can stop and look. You can take photos. You can make notes on your smartphone. You can make a short video. You can do a quick drawing. You can pause and meet the people that you encounter on the trail. I think the best thing that happens when you pay attention is that you start really absorbing the beauty of the park. You relax and you realize that you haven't enjoyed life this much since the last time you were out at the park or somewhere beautiful outdoors and I think just taking that time to pay attention is really really crucial um, so I am ready to answer any questions that you may have um, would really love to talk to you more so Allie thank you um, I will I will stop sharing and go to that all right, so I am back. 
Uh, looks like we've got some great questions here. Uh, I'm just going to gently remind you all audience members, if you have questions, now is the time. We would so love to hear from you. Go ahead and throw those in the Q&A box. We're going to get to as many as we can. So let's see. I have, an, uh, I have a question from an anonymous attendee that says, um, does the Mount Rainier book include information about paint color mixtures that you use as uh, the same way that Colors of the West does? My approach is a little different in uh, the tour of Rainier. My focus is on exposing you to all the best sites of Rainier. So it will not give you that kind of information in detail. So I have another anonymous attendee who wants to know um, how you choose which media to use to capture both natural beauty or such natural beauty. Uh, when do you select watercolor, ink, block print, etc.? That's a great question. Um, I find that landscapes, I have the best success with landscapes using just pure watercolor. Um, you can capture effects of light, and uh, it's very difficult to do that with pen, block prints, and etchings, qualities of light. You almost need oil painting. You need oil paints, pastels, or watercolor, I think, to really capture that. But I find sometimes with mammals and birds and plants and trees, you can have a lot of fun with pen etchings. I've done a lot of tree etchings. Um, and block prints, um, pen and wash, block prints, etchings, all kinds of things work really well for, uh, I would say, smaller, smaller things, you know, not full landscapes. So I have, there's a lot of questions about the materials that you use. I have one here from Catherine that says, what are some of your favorite watercolors to use, both brands and colors? And then from Susan, we have someone, or we have her asking about the pens. Do you use water soluble or permanent ink? Excellent question. Uh, you may remember my sketch from Glacier Basin. I had some black and white, uh, black and white, vignettes that I used a water soluble black pen on. But if I'm going to add watercolor, I use a, a permanent black pen. And I, I tend to like a finer point pen, although the little sketch I closed with the sooty grouse, that was kind of a bolder pen. So yeah. Um, let's see here. We also, the other question that's coming up a lot is your favorite spots at Mount Rainier. Um, how would you plan a trip to Mount Rainier? What is something that you think people should definitely see when they go? You know, I think that's a great, really good question. And seasonally, I think, is the real key. What season are you visiting in? So, for instance, you know, I went to the Carbon River entrance in January. I'm telling you, the day that I was there a couple of years ago, it was pouring. I mean, absolutely pouring. I felt like buckets were dumping on me. And yet there was something incredibly beautiful about all that water. And it is a wet part of the park. So in some ways, if you're at the Carbon River, that seems, you know, winter is perfect for the Carbon River because it doesn't generally snow down there. And if you like that kind of wet forest, temperate rainforest, that is a great time to go there. Now, the wildflower meadows at, at Paradise probably are at their peak in July. So you might plan a trip there in July. The fall color, well, we just missed that. I was on the Mount Rainier webcam. By the way, that's a really good way to plan your trip. In the morning, <laughs> look at the Mount Rainier webcam and see what's happening. So this morning I looked at it and there's like maybe an inch or two of snow. It's really beautiful. But all that fall color of the heather meadows, uh, that'll be gone because there's snow now. And, um, you know, you can't get from, at a certain point, Stevens Canyon Road is closed from the west side. So you won't be able to go to Ohanapakosh to see the Grove of the Patriarchs at this time of year. I think summer is a fine time to see that. Um, Glacier Basin, that uh, kind of probably June, early July, you might 
find it snow free enough to do part of that hike. And sunrise, you know, it takes a lot longer for the snow to melt at that elevation. So uh, it's a good idea to know what elevation you're going to because you won't end up having a great hike if, this, if it's still really snowed in. By the way, I didn't answer the question about the, my favorite watercolors. Uh, my favorite watercolors are made by Daniel Smith. That's pretty much exclusively what I use. I think they're very high quality and I, I love them. So let's see, we have a, a question from Spencer that says, I know you have great taste in books. Can you speak to how literature influences your visual art? Wow, thank you, Spencer. Well, I mentioned this writer, um, Floyd Schmo. Um, he, he, you guys really need to check out his book, A Year at Paradise. He, he, he was a soldier in World War I and he had very traumatic experience. And he came to Paradise and was a caretaker at the Paradise Lodge right after it opened. And there's something deeply moving about reading his account of how he was healed by being at Rainier from the trauma of the war. Uh, I think if you wanna read a book about Rainier, that would be my number one choice. But <clears throat> as far as other books, I read a lot of fiction and poetry. Um, yeah, wow. Let's see. <laughs> right now, uh, this has nothing to do with Rainier, but I'm reading Fathers and Sons by Yvonne Turgenia for my book group, and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> I'll always talk to anybody about books. <laughs> yeah, I get that. <laughs> right. So let's see. We have a lot of questions about when you are teaching classes. Will you be teaching any classes soon? And do you teach uh, classes for kids? Thanks, great question. Well, I'm planning to teach a couple virtual classes for the uh, Winslow Art Center in January. Um, <clears throat> also, we'll be doing something for the North Cascades Institute. And next July, I'm going to uh, Yosemite and I'm gonna be teaching at Tuolumne Meadows. I'm very excited about it. Whole new experience for me. I've been there before, but I've never taught a class. Uh, as far as children, I love teaching kids. And in the past, I, I did library programs for King County and Snow Isle Library Systems practically every year. And I really miss that. And I really look forward to getting back to that. And those are free programs. And I love that. So though, that's what I do for kids. Awesome. And it looks like um, Marissa linked events in the chat. So if you go and find the um, www.mollyhashimoto.com slash events, you'll get more information there. So let's see, a quick question from Lynn. What sketchbooks do you use? Great question. Um, <clears throat> I was in the habit of using Arches sketchbooks. They're spiral bound. You guys saw the picture of them in the slideshow. And unfortunately, they stopped making them. So I found a guy in South Seattle who makes sketchbooks for me. I buy the Arches paper and he binds them for me. It's not cheap, but... Uh, the problem is I started these in 1998 and Arches stopped making them you know, a couple of years ago and I just didn't really want to go to some totally new thing. I kind of like the, the orderliness of having all the sketchbooks look the same on my shelf. I've told people this a bunch of times, but you know, when you're an artist, you've got stuff floating all over your studio and you can never find anything and you feel like everything is out of order and chaotic. And I just like the idea of looking at this whole shelf of sketchbooks that look the same. It makes me feel like I have some, some little control and that's a good thing. I think I get that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question from Paul. Uh, it says, how did you learn to slow down and notice the wildflowers, all the different peaks and the details of the landscape? That's a really fine question. You know, when I was in my 20s, I was not one to slow down. I was really gung-ho. And I have to say, though, I never didn't notice the trees and the flowers. You just can't go to Rainier without noticing them. 
But I'd say at that point in my life, I wasn't compelled to learn their names or to draw them. So, you know, I think some things happen as you get older, and I'm very grateful that I have slowed down. Um, I think being an artist does help you slow down because you really can't do art while you're rushing through a landscape. You do have to slow down and really look at things. So I think that forced me to slow down a bit, and I'm very, very glad about that. So here's a wonderful question from an anonymous attendee. What do you hope readers take away from your new Mount Rainier book? Oh, I love that question, because really, I think that's one of the most important things about the book. I, I want people to look at it and go, wow, I could, I could try that. I bet I could do that. That would really make this even more special to me if I could do a drawing or if I could write about some experience I have or maybe make a video of something I hear. Um, that's what I really want. You know, it, also there are some secret little hidden things like certain flowers and, you know, not everybody would notice that. So I think that's what I'd really like people to take away from the book. So I have a couple more questions, a follow up from Lynn, uh, who wants to know what size of sketchbook you use. Um, the paper that I now am getting cut for these journals I'm having made, um, it's about 10 and a half by 13 and a half inches. And then what materials do you consider essential for plein air painting? Uh, what do you bring with you when you go out? You know, I think you can get by with a very small paint box, um, pencil, pen, eraser, you know, we do make mistakes. Um, and you don't have to use the arches paper. I mean, I've used a slicker, smoother paper, um, and that works okay too. There are, there are certain types of sketches where if pen is the basis for the sketch, then it doesn't matter whether you use the arches paper. But I, I'm really sold on the arches paper because I like landscape so much. It's very important, I think, if you're gonna get those light effects and the, the washes that are smooth, you really have to use the right paper. So, uh, it, Valerie says, when will you start teaching in person again? It's Valerie. So I'm assuming this is someone you know. <laughs> um, well, I, I definitely want to do it uh, next year. Um, kind of waiting to see what happens just as everyone else is. Yeah, aren't we all? Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> so but, this I miss it. Let me tell you, I, I totally miss it. I just being an artist working in my studio is totally not what I want to do. Like the other day at Seward Park, I think that is about the most fun I've had in a very long time. I just have to tell you really quickly, these boys about eight or nine years old, they were watching me demonstrate and I was trying to make it go fast because I knew they just really couldn't wait to start painting. And I, I saw them galloping over to where they were going to paint and it just made me feel so good and so happy and I tell you I really miss that so yeah I will I will start teaching as soon as I can. <laughs> so we have a question from an anonymous attendee that says at what age did you start making art? Oh yeah I think I was probably about 10 or 11. Um, yeah I just did cartoons my family family house scenes. I don't know why I did that, but that's what I started with. And then I think my most, probably the most uh, serious art I did, this is kind of weird, but you booksellers will really appreciate this. I copied the covers of my favorite paperback books. And there were some really great paperback book artists at that time, as there still are. But yeah, that's, that's how I got into illustration. You're right, I do love that. <laughs> so we have a question from an anonymous attendee that would like to know um, about what you are working on next. What's coming up for you? Well, 
I am uh, completing the work on trees of the West. Um, trees have been a big passion of mine for quite a long time, and I've had so much fun researching it and writing it and talking about some of my personal experiences with trees, which might sound a little strange just because, you know, it's not like an animal or a person, but I, uh, I've just had so many very good experiences in places where the trees really moved me. So it's been a joy and I'll be working on that for the next several months, but uh, it's, it's in the editorial process and I've worked with some great editors and that's what I'm up to right now. So we have a question about, I believe his name is Floyd Schmo. Is that correct? Yeah. The author, the World War One veteran. Yes. Um, so we're looking for spelling. So give me just a second, Anne. Um, I'm looking, I'm, I'm going to find that real quick. Uh, and then we have a question from an anonymous attendee about paper. Cold press, hot press, or rough? Um, it depends on what you're doing with it. Some of those pen and wash uh, wildflower sketches I did, I used a hot press paper. You know, sometimes you don't want that broken line that can happen on a cold press, which is a bit rougher. Uh, when I'm doing landscapes, boy, I really like the cold press because hot press, you end up with edges and it gets a little bit, um, you just end up with edges no matter how good or how experienced a painter you are. I don't find it ideal for landscapes. So cold press for landscapes, hot press for pen and wash detail type things, maybe for architecture too. All right, so thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, audience members, this is your last chance. If you have any questions, go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, I think this has been such a wonderful talk. Um, I so appreciate you being here with us. Yeah, Marissa is saying, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Molly. And I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think at this point, we're sort of reaching the end of our time together. Oh, yep. Thank yous. Thank yous all the way around um, in, the, in the chat and in the question spaces. So thank you all so much for being here. Molly, thank you so much for coming. This was such a wonderful talk. And thank you for sharing your art with us. Um, audience members, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we're so happy that you showed up. For anyone who would like to get your hands on a copy, go ahead and follow those links in the chat. Um, if you are local, of course, come on in, grab a copy, uh, let us know what you thought about this event, either in person or online. We always, always love to hear from you. Molly, one more huge, huge thank you. This has been so wonderful. And I think that this is where we start our awkward waving. So <laughs> thank you, everyone. And thank you, Allie. I really appreciate it. All righty. Good night, everyone. Good night.